me in the last weekend. So um, you'll have lots of time to learn this shoulder information. So the first um, bone that we're going to start with is the sternum because that is the first attachment of the upper extremity to the body. Um, the sternum is located in the midpoint of the anterior thorax. Um, it has three main portions, the manubrium, which is the most superior portion, and that articulates with the clavicle, um, forming the sternoclavicular joint. The body is the middle portion, and it's the anterior attachment point for ribs two through seven. And the xiphoid process is the inferior tip of the sternum, and xiphoid meaning sword-shaped in Latin, of course. Manubrium is also a Latin word, and it means shield. Um, and it makes sense when you look at the shape of the top of that manubrium. So the sternum is a landmark for a lot of things. As all of you know, it's a landmark for um, CPR. That's where we put our hands when we're doing chest compressions. Um, and it's the attachment point for the clavicle, which is the only bony attachment of the upper extremity to the body. Um, the clavicle, it's the S-shaped bone that links the scapula to the sternum. So when we're talking about the shoulder complex, we're not just talking about the glenohumeral joint, we're talking about the sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the scapulothoracic joint, and finally, the glenohumeral joint. So um, the scapula has, um, at the acromial end, which is its flattened lateral portion, it articulates with the acromion, forming the acromioclavicular joint. Um, a lot of times when you go over the bars on your bike, that's uh, what gets dislocated. Um, the medial or sternal end of the clavicle articulates with the manubrium forming, forming the sternoclavicular joint. So the thing that I always remember, and I don't know why, but this is sort of a silly thing, but um, in the Middle Ages, when knights were fighting with swords, um, the devastating move um, to take out your opponent was to um, get him on the clavicle to break his clavicle is really what they would do and that he would lose the use of his sword arm and um, so if you think of the clavicle as being the only bony attachment of the upper extremity to the um, body that totally makes sense right so think about your medieval knights and um, your clavicle being your only bony attachment and you'll know why that was the devastating move when in the medieval combat the scapula, um, one of my favorite bones, I work with it all the time. Um, it's a highly mobile triangular shaped bone. It rests on the posterior side of the thorax. Um, it attaches um, through the clavicle to the sternum. That's its only bony attachment to the axial skeleton. Um, and then the glenoid fossa of the scapula articulates with the head of the humerus. Um, the landmarks on the scapula we're gonna there are a lot of them and a lot of them are attachments for muscles and so that's why we're learning them we'll go through all these in lab as well the subscapular fossa is on the anterior side of the scapula it's slightly concave um, and it allows the scapula to glide smoothly along the convex posterior rib cage so we talk about the scapula thoracic joint as being a functional joint. Even though it's not two bone ends coming together, it's actually a concave convex relationship. Um, and it's the concave um, subscapular fossa moving on the convex rib cage. The glenoid fossa is a slightly concave oval shaped surface that accepts the head of the humerus comprising the glenohumeral joint. So the head of the humerus is um, convex, the glenoid fossa is concave, and we'll talk a lot more about that particular area of the scapula. The, um, going to the posterior side of the scapula, um, first we'll talk on the glenoid fossa, there are the superior and inferior glenoid tubercles. So they're little bumps. Um, they border the superior and inferior aspects of the glenoid fossa. We actually might be able to see them um, better in this picture, eh, maybe not, but we'll be able to see them well on a bony model and palpate them on a bony model. You can't palpate them on a human being, but you can palpate them on a bony model. 
Um, as far as palpation goes with the previous things we talked about, the stern, the whole sternum is very palpable, um, except for the clavicular facet because it's inside the sternoclavicular joint. Um, the whole clavicle is very palpable, except, of course, the joint surfaces. Um, the subscapular fossa is not palpable, but you can find it on a bony model. Same with the glenoid fossa. The superior and inferior glenoid tubercles also not palpable, but you can find them on a bony model. We go back around the corner um, to the scapular spine. It's, um, the, it's on the posterior side of the scapula. It divides the scapula's posterior aspect into the supraspinatus fossa and the infraspinatus fossa, also called the supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa. Um, so those are areas where muscles attach. And the spine is also a good landmark for a lot of other things, um, such as muscle attachments, the attachment of the um, rhomboid, uh, the rhomboids and the middle trapezius, and um, it's also a good landmark for telling whether your scapula are elevated or depressed. Um, it's palpable on just about everybody. I have. I don't think I've ever met anybody who I couldn't palpate their scapular spine. Um, as the scapular spine um, turns the corner on the lateral edge there, it flattens out and becomes the acromion process, which then articulates with the clavicle to form the acromioclavicular joint. So the acromion process, it's flat. You can palpate it right now on your shoulders. It's a wide, flattened projection of bone that's the most superior lateral aspect of the scapula. It forms a roof over the humeral head, and it protects delicate structures like the um, tendon of the supraspinatus and um, lots of ligaments on there. So um, it's a functional roof, but that, in that respect, it closes things in, and so it's often an area for impingement, and we will talk a lot about that. Um, definitely the Kuromian process is palpable. The coracoid process, also palpable, although I have met a few people, if, if someone has a really thick, dense um, pectoralis major, um, like bodybuilder type pectoralis major, it is really hard to dig in there and find their coracoid process. Um, it's a finger-like or beak-like bone projection from the anterior scapular surface. It's an attachment site for several muscles lig and ligaments of the shoulder complex. Um, so. Specifically, the long head of the biceps tendon, um, the short head of the biceps tendon, I mean, the short head of the biceps tendon attaches on the um, coracoid process. The long head of the biceps tendon attaches on the supraglenoid tubercle. So <clears throat> the medial and lateral borders of the scapula are very palpable. They meet at the inferior angle. Um, the inferior angle is important to be able to palpate in um, tracking scapular motion. So it's the point at the bottom of the scapula. The point at the top of the scapula is the superior angle, and that's an important attachment for um, a troublesome little muscle called the levator scapula. So um, that's a good one to be able to find as well. And we will palpate all of these on each other in lab. So the medial border, um, strangely enough, is um, on the medial side of the scapula, and the lateral border is on the lateral side. Another name for the medial border of the scapula is the vertebral border, and because um, it's nearer the vertebrae. And another name for the lateral border is the axillary border, because it's nearer the axilla or the armpit, if you prefer that term. Um, so going on to the humerus, the proximal humerus is an attachment point for tons of ligaments and muscles. And it, those ligaments and muscles link the upper extremity to the shoulder girdle. So um, the, if it, the stability of the shoulder is really dependent on muscle and ligament attachments. The humeral head is um, nearly one half of a full sphere um, that articulates with the glenoid fossa, and it comprises the glenohumeral joint. So you can see just looking at the pictures and when you look at bony models that the, the um, glenohumeral joint isn't nearly as deep as the, um, the uh, femoral acetabular joint or the hip joint. 
So the hip joint is much more stable than, it, it's a ball and socket joint, just like the glenohumeral joint, but it's much more stable, um, highly stabilized by ligaments and muscles, as well as the shoulder. We don't have the same range of motion in the hip, and we don't walk around on our hands. So um, our shoulders are super mobile, our hips are super stable. So um, on the spectrum of stability to mobility, um, shoulder glenohumeral joint is on the uh, mobility side, and the hip joint is on the stability side. So the um, we have two tubercles, lesser tubercle and greater tubercle, and these are palpable, and we will palpate them in lab. Okay, they're big bony bumps. What does that mean? Muscle attachments. Lots of muscles attached to the tubercles. The lesser tubercle is more um, anterior and medial. The um, greater tubercle is more posterior and lateral. So the lesser tubercle is a little sharper. It's just below the humeral head. The greater tubercle is a little more rounded, and you can palpate them both. I'm doing it right now on my shoulder. Um, the intertubercular groove, also known as the bicipital groove, divides the greater and lesser tubercles, and you can palpate that. It houses the tendon of the long head of the biceps, and so sometimes when you palpate it, it can be pretty tender. So be nice to your classmates when you're palpating their bicipital groove. If you find the groove, you can internally and externally rotate your shoulder to bump up against the tubercles. So that's a really good landmark to be able to find things. I'll still, I still remember when I was in kinesiology in school, um, in our final practical where we were palpating shoulder structures, um, I got the greater tubercle on a person. My lab partner had the best greater tubercle ever. It stuck right out. You could almost see it. <laughs> and so it was a really easy palpation. I'll never forget that. The deltoid tuberosity is um, on the lateral aspect of the upper third of the humerus shaft, and just like its name sounds, it's where the deltoids insert. It's the distal insert insertion of all three heads of the deltoid muscle. So any place where you have big, strong muscles inserting, you're going to have a bump. Okay, the radial or spiral groove runs obliquely across the posterior surface of the humerus, and it houses the radial nerve and it helps define the distal attachment for the lateral and medial head of the triceps. Um, it is palpable on most people, however, it is a difficult palpation and I will not ask you to palpate that um, on a person in the lab practical. I might ask you to find it on a bony model, but um, I definitely will not ask you to palpate that because it's not easily palpable on everybody. Um, people who have um, nice uh, tiny <laughs> arm muscles, it's a little easier to find. People with big beefy arm muscles, it's a little harder to find. Um, so those are all the bony landmarks we're going to talk about for right now. Of course, in lab, as you know by now, you'll have a list of bony landmarks and a pile of bones, and you get to find all those on the bones, and then also find them on your classmates. So um, as I always say, if you can't find something, on a person, you can't treat it in the clinic. So your landmarks are going to give you locations of muscles, locations of ligaments, goniometric landmarks. Um, it's really important to be able to palpate those landmarks. So um, we're going to go on to supporting structures um, because even though there are tons of muscles in the shoulder, there are not as many um, landmarks as there are in the hip. Isn't that interesting? Um, so I'm combining the stability lecture with the osteology lecture. Um, the sternoclavicular ligament contains the anterior and posterior fibers um, joining the clavicle to the manubrium. So you can see in this picture, it's like the little waterfall that runs off the clavicle onto the manubrium. And um, it stabilizes that sternoclavicular joint. Um, the joint capsule surrounds the entire joint, like shrink wrap, like our other joint capsules, and it's reinforced by the anterior and posterior sternoclavicular joint ligaments. Um, so a lot of times we have ligaments to back up our joint capsules to reinforce them and stabilize them. The interclavicular ligament spans the jugular notch at the top of the manubrium, and connects the superior medial aspects of the clavicles. It limits clavicular depression. So um, 
in this picture you don't see both clavicles. You see where the interclavicular ligament is going off to the other clavicle, but you can imagine if the um, distal or lateral ends of the clavicles depress, the medial ends are going to put that interclavicular ligament on stretch or on taut. And um, so the tautness of that ligament is going to limit the amount that the ends of the clavicles can depress. So the costoclavicular ligament, um, costo means ribs, clavicular means clavicular. Um, and so the costoclavicular ligament attaches the costal cartilage of the first rib to the clavicle. So it, that also limits um, extremes of clavicular motion, except depression, because depression puts it on slack. But um, elevation puts it on stretch, and um, the uh, really the you see the ligaments around the clavicle are pretty short because there's not a lot of movement in that joint. The movement you have is important, though. I've had people who have um, shoulder restrictions, glenohumeral restrictions, and also um, sternoclavicular restrictions. And if you mobilize that sternoclavicular joint, you can often get better glenohumeral motion because that's the first link in the chain, right? There's an articular disc in the um, sternoclavicular joint that absorbs shock between the clavicle and the sternum and helps improve joint congruency. So you can imagine anytime if you're reaching out to catch something or stop yourself with your hands or you're doing push-ups or any number of things that we do with our hands, um, somebody um, wrote in their in one of their learning reflections about um, picking up their child well, that puts a lot of stress on the sternoclavicular joint so um, the it's nice to have that disc to absorb the shock between the clavicle and the sternum so the acromioclavicular joint has tons of uh, ligaments <laughs> or you know it has a lot we'll just say um, ligaments mostly are great because they tell you where they go to and where they go, you know, to and from. So chromioclavicular ligament, it goes from the acromion to the clavicle. Joins the clavicle to the acromion, helps prevent dislocation of the scapula. It links the motion of the scapula to the clavicle, or vice versa. When we talk about joint motions, we'll talk about how they affect each other. The coracoclavicular ligament, so it goes from the coracoid to the clavicle. And there's also a, a coracoid acromial ligament goes from the coracoid to the acromion. Um, the coracoclavicular ligament it's composed of two separate ligaments, the conoid and the trapezoid, and together they form that um, coracoclavicular ligament. And basically, they're the little hooks that suspend the scapula from the clavicle, and they prevent inferior acromial dislocation. So you can see when the acromion is pushed down. Those um, ligaments are on taut. They're um, preventing the dislocation of that acromion process. So um, the articular disc, there's an articular disc in the acromion clavicular joint as well to improve joint congruency and absorb compressive forces. So there are those fibrocartilaginous discs, just like our intervertebral discs, um, except they're smaller and not as structured. But um, the carcoacromial ligament, which we saw on the last slide, the, the diagonal one there, um, attaches the carcoid to the acromion. It's part of the carcoacromial arch, that functional roof that protects the head of the humerus. So we have a lot of muscles that support the glenohumeral joint. The rotator cuff muscles, which we'll talk about in detail in the uh, muscle section, but they surround the humeral head actively and they hold the humeral head against the glenoid fossa. Um, as probably a lot of you know, the um, rotator cuff muscles are also known as the SITS muscles, S-I-T-S, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. So um, three of them are on the posterior side of the scapula and the subscapularis is on the anterior side of the scapula. And so they surround the head of the humerus and help hold it actively against the glenoid fossa. So here's the, the cadaver picture of the anterior shoulder. And you can see 
just how beefy that glenohumeral joint capsule is. So there are a couple of things um, pointed out in here. The corcochromial ligament, you can sort of see that diagonal line. The coracoid process, um, the greater tubercle of the humerus there, and right next to that you can see the biceps tendon, long head of the biceps tendon, and the acromion right up there. So this has been dissected a little bit and some of that connective tissue has been um, cut off, but you can just see how much connective tissue is supporting the structure. So the glenohumeral joint capsule itself is a thin fibrous capsule um, that includes the, the superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. So there's another set of ligaments that tells you where they go to and from, from the glenoid to the humerus. Um, the joint capsule attaches between the glenoid fossa rim and the neck of the humerus. So um, that's really helping improve joint congruency. So the glenohumeral joint, of course, has um, more ligaments. The coracohumeral li ligament, there's another one that tells you where it goes from the coracoid to the humerus. Um, it's on the anterior side of the greater tubercle is where it attaches. It limits external rotation. So look at, look at its line of pull there. You can see if you were to externally rotate the humerus, that coracohumeral ligament would be on um, stretch or it would be in its tightened position. It limits flexion. Imagine that. We'll do it with bones in the lab. It limits extension. Same thing. And it limits inferior displacement of the humeral head. All of those things put, put that in a taut position. Um, the opposite things, um, so a superior displacement of the humeral head puts that in a slack position, in a shortened position. Internal rotation also puts it in a slack position. Um, extension and um, the uh, mid-range between flexion and extension, it's in a, it's in a more slack position. So um, look at your ligaments, look at what they stop. If you need to visualize it, when you're in the lab, take a humerus and a scapula, put them together and get some tape and tape from the greater tubercle to the uh, coracoid process and see what motion that stops. So it's the strapping tape of our body, right? The ligament. And so what motions does it prevent? The glenoid labrum, much like the um, labrum of the hip, um, is a fibrocartilaginous ring that encircles the rim of the glenoid fossa. It nearly doubles the functional depth of the glenoid fossa and it stabilizes the joint by maintaining a suction effect between the humerus and the glenoid fossa. So um, it deepens the socket and gives you that suction effect. So it, um, it's a sta big stabilizer for the um, glenohumeral joint. The long head of the biceps tendon, so let's go back a couple slides. In this picture, you can see that um, long vertical structure anteriorly. That's the long head of the biceps tendon. It attaches to the um, supraglenoid tubercle um, and then goes down to the uh, bicipital tuberosity on the radius. But it um, provides the proximal portion attaches to that superior glenoid tubercle and provides anterior stability of the head of the biceps, I mean of the head of the humerus. So the head of the humerus is kind of stopped by that big anterior structure keeping it from going anteriorly.